Hey everyone, welcome back. This is Dr. Dilip, your Internal Medicine faculty at Cerebellum. Today we're going to have a quick discussion of most, if not all, of the medicine questions that was asked in the recent NEET PG 2024 session. And you will be really surprised to know how many questions has been asked in medicine because there are easily 100 plus questions from both the sessions combined, of course. And I can easily isolate 50 to 60 questions plus in each session. And you might be arguing with me asking that uh, these are not the exact lines from the questions that we have discussed in the ENDs as well as from the notes, but they are kind of transcripts from the concepts that we have discussed. You'll be understanding as we move through the discussion. And I purposefully left on like 10, 20 questions in each shift because they are more into the basic clinical sciences, but trust me, like there are plenty of questions. And before starting the discussion, let me give you a quick disclaimer. It's a recall based discussion and not the actual questions. Be very clear about it. And we all know that the actual questions were quite lengthy. In fact, extremely lengthy. And this is just the essence of those questions and not the actual questions. Few questions may be mixed up between the shifts because I'll be initially discussing the first shift, then I'll be moving on to the second shift. But if the questions are mixed up, please don't blame me. And some questions may seem ambiguous because there is inherent variability in the recall. And even in the previous exams, we tend to see some variability, but this exam contained a lot of questions which were extremely lengthy and students did struggle a lot to get the recall. But anyways, even we did struggle and finally we got the recall and here we are. And of course, there will be some variability and please don't get confused with regards to that as well. And purpose of this recall session is to understand the essence of what's asked so that it will be useful for your own personal assessment as well as uh, for the future exams, but not to know the actual exact questions being asked. So with that disclaimer, let us move on to the discussion. Here is your first question from shift one. A 54 year old female present with shortness of breath on examination. She had bibasal crackles and third heart sound, which is pointing towards a probable heart failure. Echocardiogram revealed a poor cardiac contractility with an ejection fraction of 33%, which means this patient is definitely suffering from heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. Which of the following drugs can reduce mortality? We know there are four important drugs often referred to as the Fantastic Four, the RNAs, ACE inhibitors and the ARB group. Then we have the beta blocker group. Then we have the MRA group, which includes spironolactone and epilatinone. And finally, we have the SGLT2 inhibitor group. All of these drugs can reduce mortality in terms of HFREF, but the options are all about beta blockers. So we know that there are three beta blockers that can reduce mortality and improve survival in the context of HFREF. So what are those beta blockers? We had a mnemonic for that as well. These are called as the MBC beta blockers, which includes the metoprolol, bisoprolol, and carvedilol. We know that metoprolol and bisoprolol are kind of cardioselective drugs, but carvedilol is not cardioselective. In fact, it works on beta 1, beta 2, and it has alpha inhibitory action as well. So among the four given options, the easiest one to choose is going to be bisoprolol because that's been shown clearly to reduce survival, to reduce mortality and improve survival in terms of HFREF patients. Let us move on to the second question. A 38-year-old patient presents with chest pain and hoarseness of voice. For the last one month, the MRI of the patient is shown. Which of the following is the likely diagnosis? If you look at the MRI, or probably it could be a CECT image as well, doesn't matter. You can clearly notice that there is a saccular aneurysm coming from the aortic arch. And even in 3D reconstruction images, you can clearly notice that there is a saccular aneurysm that's coming out of the aortic arch. And this may probably be compressing on the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And probably that could be the reason why this patient is having hoarseness of voice. So right answer for this question is a simple, straightforward option A. Let us move on to the third question. A 33-year-old patient present with chest pain, shortness of breath and edema. On examination, his pulse was irregularly irregular, probably pointing towards an atrial fibrillation and JVP was elevated. And JVP did show a prominent Y descent. So we all know there are very few causes of prominent Y descent in that one of the important causes is constrictive pericarditis. And the second most important cause I would say is tricuspid regurgitation. But here the clinical picture is not favoring tricuspid regurgitation. So if you have a prominent Y descent in constrictive pericarditis, this is also referred to as something called as Friedrich sign. We have discussed so many times. And on auscultation, he had a high-pitched diastolic sound. In the context of constrictive pericarditis, this high-pitched diastolic sound must be a pericardial knock. And what is the diagnosis? Of course, we have discussed so much. I'm not going to 
to anything other than constructive pericarditis as the answer, right? End of discussion. Let us move on to the fourth question. Why a patient who has aortic stenosis experiences easy fatigue as compared to a patient with aortic regurgitation? So we know that aortic stenosis is a condition we are going to have a fixed LVOT obstruction and because of that, there's going to be considerable increase in the pressure of the left ventricle and there's going to be pressure overload and that's the reason for left ventricular hypertrophy and the hypertrophy left ventricle is going to suck in a lot of energy it's going to demand a lot of energy and there's going to be a lot of myocardial oxygen consumption that can even cause angina and heart failure over a period of time we have discussed all those things in our lectures and right answer for this question of course is going to be option a because pressure overload is the main factor that causes problems in patients with aortic stenosis and this is going to cause more myocardial demand compared to that of volume overload that's absolutely a true statement option b is wrong because the yc versa is wrong and option c is definitely wrong because a is is going to cause pressure overload for sure and option four states that preload increases myocardial oxygen demand more than afterload so preload increase means it's an alternative statement uh, for probably I can say volume overload and afterload increase means it's an alternative statement for pressure overload, even though not exactly the same but you can equate like that so right answer for this question is going to be option a simple coming to fifth question a patient with hypertension CKD presented with generalized tiredness ECG is taken and shown what is the diagnosis what we have in the ECG so this is a straightforward case of hyperkalemia because this ECG is showing tall T waves and of course, this patient is having white QRS, which indicates conduction blocks. And this ECG doesn't have any P wave. If you look at the rhythm strip in lead 2, you do not have any P waves at its usual location. You cannot see any discernible P waves, which indicates an atrial paralysis, absence of conduction within the atrium, which is very classic of hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is a very unique condition because it produces a combination of both conduction blocks and it also causes overexcitation, causing arrhythmias. So it's a very unique condition. So, right answer for this question. You want me to repeat? You can say by yourself. It's going to be hypercal. Right. So going to the sixth question. A 53-year-old male patient who is a known case of COPD developed uh, breathlessness and is on mechanical ventilation. He suddenly developed hypoxia and on examination, he has reduced or probably absent breath sounds on the left hemithorax with increased peak inspiratory pressure. So what is the likely diagnosis? This is a question based on our discussion on how to evaluate a patient who is experiencing a acute ventilatory deterioration. So whenever a patient experiences an acute ventilatory deterioration, so what is the first thing you need to look at? You have to look at something called as peak inspiratory pressure that's called as PIP. So you have three options here. So PIP can be normal or PIP can be reduced or PIP can be increased. Whenever the PIP is normal, you're going to think about some extra pulmonary causes or extra paranormal causes like pulmonary embolism for that matters and if the PIP is reduced you have to suspect leak elsewhere in case if the PIP is increased then it could be due to either increased resistance in the airways or probably due to uh, poor lung complaints so how will you find out so in this case you have to find out something called as plateau pressure in case if the plateau pressure is normal you can assume that the problem is increased airway resistance where you can think about possibilities like sudden bronchospasm or even like mucus plugging of the tubes. In case the plateau pressure is increased, you're going to think about reduced pulmonary complaints, reduced lung complaints or reduced pulmonary complaints. So this is the algorithm that you have discussed. And here the patient is having increased peak inspiratory pressure. So definitely I can rule out something called as pulmonary embolism. And it is not acute exacerbation of COPD because uh, there, there is no mention about uh, the normal plateau pressure. Plus at the same time, your patient is having like reduced or absent breath sounds on one side. So that doesn't really go with acute exacerbation. So I can ignore that option as well. And it's not really pneumonia. Patient can have pneumonia. But again, this reduced or absent breath sounds on one side is not going to typically indicate a pneumonia. So pneumonia typically going to expect something like bronchial breathing or probably consolidation in imaging so that's not given here so i can easily exclude that option the right answer for this question is pneumothorax which is a classic classic condition in icu patients because of barotrauma that can cause an acute ventilated deterioration sudden hypoxemia so where your peak inspiratory pressures rise all of a sudden but in this case you will have increase in 
the plateau pressure as well. So that's an additional point that you can know now at least. Let us move to the next question. A patient underwent a major 14 hour long surgery in prone position and continues to be on ventilator during recovery. What is the advantage of positive end expiratory pressure in mechanical ventilation? The main reason why we use positive end expiratory pressure in the setting of mechanical ventilation is to keep the alveoli in a partially open state. This increases FRC and of course increase in FRC is going to increase oxygenation and gas exchange. And what is the advantage of keeping alveoli in a partially open state? So remember, uh, if you compare two balloons, which is, uh, one, let us assume one is partially inflated already and one is completely collapsed. You know that this is easier to open up further. It's easy to blow up. But this balloon, which is completely collapsed, is going to take a lot of initial energy to open up and then it becomes a bit easy. So if you look at the work of breathing, so this is much lesser in a partially inflated balloon. So you can remember that lungs are going to act like a balloon and if you use a positive end expiratory pressure, it keeps the alveolar in a partially open state that's technically going to reduce the work of breathing and of course it's going to increase the gas exchange or it's going to do all these things by reversing a complete atelectasis and by preventing collapse. And in fact, this has another advantage, added advantage by reducing a form of trauma called as atelectotrauma because every time you completely collapse the lungs and if you inflate it again, so it's like crumbling a paper completely and opening up again. So this creates a lot of trauma in a diseased lung. So that's what we call as atelectotrauma. So by using PEEP, you can keep the lung in a partially open state so that you can prevent that complete collapse so that you can avoid that atelectotrauma as well. So the right answer for this question is a simple straightforward option A. Going to the eighth question, a 35 year old patient present with sudden breathlessness x-ray of the patient is shown what is likely to be heard on auscultation. So this probably could be considered as a repeat question within the same shift. So you can see that the patient is having a pneumothorax. You can see the collapsed border of the lung here with hyperlucent areas in the pleural space, which is clearly suggestive of pneumothorax. And this patient is also having a bit of tracheal shift and a bit of mediastinal shift as well. So we can take this as attention pneumothorax as well. And in a pneumothorax, what are going to expect? You're going to have absent sounds or reduced breath sounds on the involved side. And of course, if you look at the percussion, it's going to be hyper and not simple. Let us move to the next question. A patient present with headache and neck stiffness, CT scan of the head and CT angiogram is shown. What is the likely diagnosis? It's simple. So if you look at the CT, this is a very common CT that we have been discussing time and again. This is the star of death that is subarachnoid hemorrhage and you can notice a nice and beautiful berry aneurysm as well. So what is the likely diagnosis? It's going to be subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's like a spot of light. I don't want to discuss anything further. 10th question, a 45 year old patient who presents with ptosis and muscle weakness was on to improve on rest. She was later diagnosed to have myasthenia gravis. Of course, they have given the diagnosis themselves. Now she complains of dysphagia and she has engorged veins on the thorax. CT scan is shown. What's the diagnosis? Look at the CT scan. There is an anterior mediastinal mass. In the context of myasthenia gravis, if you see an anterior mediastinal mass, it must be thymoma and less proved otherwise because myasthenia gravis can be a paraneoplastic syndrome in approximately 15% of the cases where the most common tumor that you encounter is going to be a thymoma. In the context of lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome, probably you can think about a small cell cancer of the lung, which is seen in 50 to 80% of the cases depending on the study you look at, but in the context of myasthenia gravis, when you see an anterior mass, 100% in exam, you're going to make a diagnosis of thymoma, but another extra edge point if you want to know, remember the most common thymic abnormality in the setting of myasthenia gravis is going to be thymic hyperplasia, and not thymoma, right? Okay, cool. Let us move on to the next question. A patient presented with ptosis and Horner syndrome. Ptosis is left out here. Sorry for that. And this ptosis is due to involvement of what? We know Horner syndrome is going to have five important components. Component one is ptosis because of loss of sympathetic supply to the Muller's muscle. And number two is going to be meiosis. And third is anhydrosis. Fourth one is going to be loss of ciliospinal reflex. And last but not the least, it's going to be the apparent enophthalmos, where the palpable fissure will appear smaller in patients with Horner syndrome. And of course, as I said, the answer is going to be A because ptosis in Horner syndrome is due to loss of sympathetic supply to the Muller's muscle. LPS is important for opening the eyelids and 
loss of uh, third nerve supplied with LPS also can result in ptosis. But remember, this is not the reason for the ptosis in Horner syndrome. This is the reason for ptosis in third nerve palsy. So you open your eyelids voluntarily with the help of third nerve and you close your eyelids voluntarily with the help of seventh nerve because seventh nerve is going to supply orbicularis ocle which is also a voluntary muscle. But Muller's muscle is an involuntary muscle which is going to be important in closure of eyelids especially during blinking process. Right. So the dosis in Horner syndrome is due to involvement of Muller's muscle. And coming to 12th question, a 21 year old patient present with weakness, fatigue, hypotension, BP is 80 upon 60 millimeters of mercury and reports show hyponatremia, hyperkalemia and this patient also has hyperpigmentation in the knuckles, arms and legs. What is the likely diagnosis? We have discussed five features. If it is there in exam, you cannot diagnose anything else apart from primary arterial insufficiency. What are those five features? Everything is there in the question. Fatigue, tightness, weakness, hypertension and tachycardia which will be usually seen in patients with um, Addisonian crisis, hypernatremia, hyperkalemia, maybe a bit of normal and metabolic astros as well. And last but not the least, don't forget the hyperpigmentation component. So what about the other options like B12 deficiency can cause hyperpigmentation, but the presentation is nowhere near B12 deficiency. And corn syndrome is something that's going to present with hypertension and hypokalemia, not hypotension and hyperkalemia. SADH, can produce hyponatremia, but I don't think uh, you can diagnose SADH in a patient who is having low BP, hypovolemia and probably hyperkalemia. So that's gone as well. So the right answer for this question, simple, straightforward, primary adrenal insufficiency, which is also called as Addison disease. So third in question, it's an ABG based question. Again, a very, very easy one in this paper. So pH of 7.26, which means the patient is having acidosis. PSEO2 is decreased and bicarbonate is also decreased. By the Rome rule, we all know that if all the arrows are moving in the same direction, it's going to be metabolic acidosis. And of course, the right answer is going to be option A. If you want to go further, so you can understand that this PSEO2 of 16 is going to be because of compensation. So where the body is try, trying to compensate the acidosis by causing a respiratory alkalosis. And this patient is of course having a high anion gap as well. If you calculate the anion gap, what do you get? So sodium minus bicarbonate plus chloride. So what's going to be the sodium? It's 135 minus bicarbonate. We know already it's going to be 8 plus chloride is 108. So it's going to be 135 minus 116. So you get an anion gap of approximately 19. So we know that anything more than 12, it's going to be called as raised anion gap. So this patient is having a HUGMA, that is high anion gap metabolic acidosis with a compensatory respiratory alkalosis. Coming to 14th question, in type 1 diabetes mellitus, what is the feature of stage 3 beta cell destruction? So we have discussed this in many of our classes in stage 1. What do you really see? In stage 1, the patient may have antibodies in the circulation, but the glycemic status will be normal. So we can say it's going to be normoglycemic and the patient will be asymptomatic as well. What about stage 2? In stage 2, of course, antibodies will be positive. Patient starts to develop dysglycemia, but it will be more of intolerance range, not frank diabetes. And patient will be asymptomatic as well. In stage 3, antibodies will be positive. Patient will be dysglycemic. And at this time, most of the patients will be having frank diabetes, which means the patient's sugar is going to meet the criteria for diagnosis of diabetes mellitus given by WHO and patient will be symptomatic where the patient starts experiencing all the osmotic and uh, metabolic side effects of high glucose like polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, weight loss and so on. So, of course, the answer for this question is going to be autoimmunity will be positive, patient will have dysglycemia and patient will be, of course, symptomatic as well. And there is a drug called as teplizumab that can actually reduce the speed of progression from stage 2 to stage 3 in experimental models. Maybe if you want to know, you can uh, think of it as a future question. 15th question, a woman at 8 weeks of gestation is diagnosed with hypothyroidism, which of the following is the most appropriate treatment option? One of the easiest questions in this paper, we know that in the first trimester, the drug of choice in a patient with Graves' disease or hypothyroidism is going to be propyl thiazole, And in the second and third trimester, probably you can switch back to carimazole or methimazole whichever feels good. And 16th question, a young woman presents with weight loss, tachycardia, heat intolerance and tremors. She has exophthalmos on examination. What is the diagnosis? It's a very, very simple and straightforward Graves' disease because patient is having thyrotoxic feature and exophthalmos means it is 
a characteristic feature of Graves' disease. Other diagnosis doesn't even come close to the presentation, right? Coming to this question, you have an 18 year old female presenting with high fever and pain in knee and ankle joints, which means patient is having fever and arthritis. On examination, patient had a pan-systolic murmur at the apex, which is very much suggestive of mitral regurgitation. Rheumatoid factor is negative. What is the diagnosis? So they have given a close DD just to confuse you, that is seronegative RA, but with acute presentation and an 18 year old with PSM at the time of presentation, I will not be really thinking about serenative RA. So my diagnosis here is going to be acute rheumatic fever, which is very common in countries like India. So in fact, this fulfills the Jones criteria, right? Patients having, uh, in fact, two major and one minor criteria, right? Fever is a minor criteria and arthritis and carditis is a major criteria. And you know, in the setting of acute rheumatic fever, the most common form of carditis that you encounter is the endocarditis. And in the endocarditis, the most common problem is valvulitis and in the valvulitis the most common valve affected is the mitral valve and when mitral valve is affected in the setting of acute rheumatic fever the most common problem that you encounter is MR that's mitral regurgitation MS is a sequelae of acute rheumatic fever and that will be calling it as rheumatic heart disease so the right answer for this question is acute rheumatic fever here is a 44 year old female who is a known case of scleroderma presenting with shortness of breath especially during exercise, she underwent right heart catheterization and her mean pulmonary pressure was 35 millimeters of mercury, which means we know that MPAP of more than 20 millimeters of mercury means we are dealing with a case of pulmonary hypertension. And in the setting of scleroderma, this pulmonary hypertension must be a type 1 pulmonary artery hypertension. The gold standard for the diagnosis and uh, possibly deciding the treatment aspects of type 1 or any pulmonary hypertension is going to be the right heart catheterization and that's what they have done. Right heart catheterization is also called as Van Gans catheterization, colloquially speaking. And which of the following is true regarding her condition? CCBs are the first line in all the patients is absolutely wrong because CCBs are given selectively for those patients who are testing positive in the vasoreactivity testing. We have discussed that time and again. And we know that in patients who do not test positive, the vasoreactivity testing, we are going to use combination therapy. One of the best form of combination therapy is a combination of phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor like tadalafil or sildenafil. Plus, we are going to use an endothelial receptor antagonist like bocentan, ambricentan or even macitentan in modern practice. So, endothelial receptor antagonist and uh, various other drugs like phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors and prostacycline analogs are definitely going to improve symptoms and the functional status of the patient. Lung transplant is the best treatment if identified early is wrong because it's very, very difficult to do a lung transplant in setting of pulmonary hypertension for various reasons. And lifestyle modification is, of course, not going to be the best treatment because uh, we're not dealing with the case of metabolic syndrome or injury. Let us move on to the 19th question. A 44-year-old male present with cough, chest x-ray revealed pleural effusion, thoracocentrics was done and the following was observed. Pleural fluid protein to serum protein ratio was 0.6. This itself confirms that we are dealing with an exudate. So as per the lights criteria, whenever the pleural fluid to serum protein ratio is more than 50% or more than 0.5, that defines an exudate according to lights criteria. And of course, some students say that they have given some value of LDH as well, but really that doesn't matter if any one of the three uh, light criteria is positive, we can say it's an exudate and here clearly we are dealing with an exudate, which of the following is the likely diagnosis. The only exudate that's given among the three is the pleural tuberculosis. All other three are basically transudates and not exudates because cirrhosis is kind of RAS activated, CHF is kind of RAS activated and nephrotic syndrome is also kind of RAS activated. So definitely these are going to be transudates and not exudates. So the only thing that fits into the exudative criteria or maybe you can say exudative cause of pleural effusion among the given causes is tuberculosis here. So that's the right answer. Easy one. 20th question, a mother brought her two-year-old child to the OPD with complaints of lack of weight gain, abdominal pain on eating and poor eating habits. The child was advised to follow a gluten-free diet after which there was a significant improvement in the general condition and weight gain. What is the probable diagnosis? Of course, this is going to be celiac disease. One of the best screening test or maybe even you can call it as a uh, best serological test that you can do in the context of celiac disease is going to be your anti-TTG IgA test. And if they ask you the gold standard, of course, it's going to be endoscopy and biopsy. But trust me, even though they call it as a gold standard, but biopsy uh, can be overlapping with multiple other diseases, including tropical sprue. But nevertheless, serological test, the best test, best screening test is going to be anti-TTG IgA. So here it's so simple and it's going to be celiac disease. Don't diagnose tropical disease, tropical sprue, because tropical sprue is usually a diagnosis of exclusion. It is commonly seen in tropical countries. We don't know the exact reason. And most of the times tropical sprue is going to present with 
B12 deficiency rather than anything else. And A beta lipoproteinemia is not going to present like this. Patient will be having neurological problems, uh, night blindness because of vitamin A deficiency, growth retardation, and uh, patients will be having that characteristic acanthocytes in the peripheral smear. We'll, I think we have a question in the shift too, if I'm not wrong. And Whipple's disease is going to present again in a very, very different way. So patient will be having dementia, cardiac involvement, and along with that patient might be having diarrhea and GI disturbances. But this patient is not having, I think, dementia or cardiac involvement. So I'm not going to make a diagnosis of Whipple's disease, which is basically caused by an uh, organism called as Trophyrma Whipple. And going to the 21st question, a 7-year-old child presents with fatigue on examination. There was scattered purpuric rashes and abdominal examination was notable for cervical lymphadenopathy and hepatosplenomegaly. Lab parameters are shown. Hemoglobin is 7, which means patient is anemic and WBC is 50,000. Patients having significant leukocytosis and platelet counts are 60,000, which means patient is thrombocytopenic as well. What is the treatment? So, 7-year-old child by cytopenia with elevated leukocyte count and patient is having cervical lymphadenopathy and hepatosplenomegaly. I'll be just blindly diagnosing ALL in this case. This is my first TD in this case with such presentation, right? So in ALL, what's the treatment that you're going to use? I think this is a question that was definitely said by someone who's practicing because he knows like what we are doing right now. So one of the integral parts of induction regime in ALL patients is a combination of a steroid like prednisolone or dexamethasone with a vincalcoloid like vincristin. So we can add doxorubicin or donorubicin, which is an anthracycline, or maybe we can even add asparaginase in the regime, which is famously called as VPDA regime. But nevertheless, these two are going to form as the core therapy for patients with acute lymphoblastic lymphoma or leukemia. So one of the problems with vincristin, you all know it's going to cause peripheral neuropathy. That's why we cap the dose at 2 milligram and not more than that. So, I mean, that's not required anyway. So the right answer for this question is a simple, straightforward prednisolone with vincristin. Other options, easily I can rule it out. It's not a big deal. Here's a 29-year-old athlete suddenly collapsed and died during a sport activity. We all know that the most common cause of sudden cardiac death or sudden death in young patients, okay, is going to be HOCM. Autopsy was done and the cardiac biopsy was shown. What is the likely diagnosis? You can notice that this patient is having like half hazard arrangement of the cardiac myocytes and this is what we called as myocyte disarray. We have discussed plenty of times in our lectures that there are three characteristic findings in the cardiac biopsy in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that is myocyte hypertrophy, interstitial fibrosis and myocyte disarray. Some pathologists do call it by a beautiful name called as helter skelter myocyte disarray. But nevertheless, so this is going to be a case of HOCM, right? 23rd question, a child present with recurrent nasal bleeding on examination. Um, there was hepatosplenomegaly. WBC count was 40,000. Peripheral smear is shown. So what peripheral smear is showing, you can see blast because these are really big atypical nucleus with a lot of nuclei. So these are basically blast. And you can see a less NC ratio, a lot of cytoplasm, it's showing granularity and you can see the characteristic OIR rod. Sometimes uh, these are also called as phagot cells, so, which means we are dealing with a myeloid leukemia. And other clues given in the question are elevated PT, APTT and T-dimer, which clearly suggests that this patient is having DIC. We know which Myeloid leukemia is going to present in the form of DIC. It's going to be acute promyelocytic leukemia, which is also previously called as AML M3. We don't use the FAB classification anymore, but nevertheless, it's AML M3, or we can call it as acute promyelocytic leukemia. The most common cytogenic abnormality in acute promyelocytic leukemia is going to be the T1517, otherwise called as PML RARA fusion, where all transretinoic acid in combination with arsenic trioxide is going to be the treatment of choice. We have discussed that plenty of times. So this is a very easy question in the context of the paper. So it is a PML RARA fusion or T1517 translocation. But we can see other translocations as well. Like we have a NUMA RARA fusion, NPM RARA fusion, which can be 517 or 1117 translocations. It really doesn't matter here. The most common, of course, is a simple question is PML RARA fusion. 24th question, 50 year old male present with polyuria, weight loss and tingling sensation in the lower limbs, bone marrow biopsy is shown. Which of the following is the likely diagnosis? What you see in the bone marrow biopsy, you can see a lot of malignant plasma cells in the bone marrow. These are malignant plasma cells and there are a lot of vacuolation. You can see some douche bodies with mod cells. So these are 
characteristic of a disorder called as multiple myeloma and that's what it is it is multiple myeloma and how multiple myeloma does correlate with the clinical picture here so multiple myeloma is going to cause hypercalcemia so definitely that is going to cause polyuria and it's a cancer so definitely weight loss is expected and this tingling sensation can be due to associated peripheral neuropathy and peripheral neuropathy may be due to amyloidosis but it can be just due to the light change itself because of excessive light change that itself can produce peripheral neuropathy which is quite common in these elderly patients who are presenting with multiple myeloma so right answer for this question simple straightforward multiple myeloma because other options that are given in the question is not really fitting into the given presentation going to the 25th question a 30 year old patient present with fatigue laboratory reports are as follows hemoglobin is 8 grams per deciliter which means patient is having significant anemia wbc is 1 lakh 50 thousand platelet is 50 thousand which means again it's like similar to the previous case that we have discussed all so patient is having bicytopenia with leukocytosis so it must be some cancer so 30 year old it may be myeloid or probably lymphoid let us have a look at the biopsy picture that's given and of course patient is having hepatosplenomegaly also they're asking what is the most common keratopic abnormality if you look at the bone marrow biopsy image these are again blasts and these are having very high nc ratio and there is very little or very scant cytoplasm if not like in certain blasts you don't even have cytoplasm that is discernible and these uh, blasts are having a granular cytoplasm very clear cytoplasm scan cytoplasm high nc ratio so this must be a lymphoid blast so in the given context i'm going to make a diagnosis of acute lymphoblastic leukemia or lymphoma and the patient is an adult it's a very tricky question patient is an adult and in adults what is the most common karyotypic abnormality it is philadelphia positivity so i'll be going for 46 xyt 922 bcr abl fusion and the second most common cytogenic abnormality in a patient with ALL and an adult is going to be hyperdiploidy. Hyperdiploidy. This is for adults, right? It's a very tricky question. People told that this is a case of CML, but even if it's CML, your answer may be right, but your understanding may be wrong. So these are going to be the most common cytogenic abnormality in adults. But if you look at ALL in a child, and if you ask me the most common karyotypic abnormality, which could be a future question, in this case, it's going to be hyperdiploidy. Okay, this is the most common cytogenic abnormality in a child with ALL, followed by the T1221 translocation, otherwise called as ETV6 run X1 fusion. So this is the second most common cytogenic abnormality in a child with ALL. So of course, the answer for this question is going to be A. 46 xyt922 coming to this question a 44 year old farmer present with fever retro pain and cough pain on examination he has conjunctival suffusion lab reports reveal uh, that probably the patient is having jaundice and even renal failure that's what the students have said what is the likely diagnosis we have discussed time and again if the question says cough pain and that characteristic back pain along with conjunctival suffusion you cannot diagnose anything apart from leptospirosis end of discussion let us move on to the next question 18 year old boy from Rajasthan weighing 50 kilograms is diagnosed with mixed Vivax and falciparum malaria. What is the most appropriate treatment regime on day two? This is a kind of a tough question, I would say, even though this is something uh, if you have studied, it may seem easier, but it's a kind of a tricky question because they have given for mixed infection. What will be the treatment on day two specifically? That's what they asked. So for Vivax, it's very simple. You're going to give chloroquine for three days and from day one, you're going to start with primaquine a dose of 0.25 milligram per kilogram or maybe 15 milligram in an adult or we can say six tablets of 2.5 milligram primaquine from day one itself and it will be continued for 14 days. Here we are giving for two reasons. One is for gametocidal region and second one is of course is going to abolish the ex exorithrocytic cycle of Vivax to prevent the risk of relapse. But in falciparum, what we do, we're going to give either ACT-SP combination or we're going to use artemether lumefantine combination if the patient is from northeastern state so this patient is clearly not from northeastern state so i can say i'm not going to give al artemether lumefantine combination so it's going to be act sp combination so for mixed infections also the regime is going to be the same so we're going to just treat how you're going to treat falciparum malaria so when you will give act sp it's going to be on the first day but from the second day onwards it's only act only artisanate 200 milligram 
So they are asking about day two. So day two, I will not be giving SP combination. So option C and option D automatically ruled out. So first day only, I'll be giving ACT 200 milligram artisanate. Along with it, I'll be giving SP combination as well. But because we are dealing with a mixer infection, we have to give primaquine just like how we give for Vivax. That is 0.25 milligram per kilogram starting from day one. Or we can say 15 milligram or we can say six tablets of 2.5 milligram primaquine. And we are going to start from day one and we'll continue till day 14. So the answer is going to be option A. So in case if it's only falciparum malaria, then on second day alone, I'll be giving 45 milligram or 0.75 milligram per kilogram of primaquine. If it's only falciparum, that is for a gambodocidal effect. Because the patient is having Vivax, I'll be using primaquine for 14 days. So day two also, it will be 15 milligram dose only. Right answer for this question is going to be option A. Coming to 28th question, 20 year old male present with diarrhea, visual symptoms and neurological manifestations based on the peripheral smear finding, what is the likely diagnosis? Look at the peripheral smear, you are seeing a lot of acanthocytes, these are cells with irregular projections. If you have regular projections around the cells, you're going to call it as burst cells or echinocytes, which is categorically seen in burns and kidney injury patients. So it's not uremia, it's not burns because you're going to see uh, burr cells or echinocytes there, but these are acanthocytes and with the given presentation, I cannot diagnose anything apart from a beta lipoproteinemia. So a beta lipoproteinemia is due to defect in a protein called as MTTP or microsomal triglyceride transfer protein, where the patient will have defective absorption of all the fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E and K. So because of malabsorption, patient will be having diarrhea, typically a fatty diarrhea and patients will be having visual symptoms because of uh, vitamin A deficiency and neurological symptoms because of probably vitamin A and E deficiency as well and um, yes of course the diagnosis here is going to be a beta lipoproteinemia 29th question are in the ecgs in order atrial flutter atrial fibrillation psvt and ptac number one so this is atrial fibrillation we know that so right so atrial fibrillation means it's one and number two you have the characteristic sawtooth appearance in the ecg so this is a flutter so I can say that a flutter is indicating the second image. The third image is a typical image of PSVT, that is paroxysmal supranatural tachycardia, where you can see a narrow complex tachycardia without any discernible P waves. So PSVT is going to be numbered as three. The remaining only one thing is left, that is VTAC, it must be four. So of course, this is a case of monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, right? So it's going to be in the order of two, one, three, four. So it's going to be option B. That's the right answer for the question. It's actually a quite easy one. Maybe it's time consuming, but it's still easy. The question, a 12 year old child present with cervical lymphonopathy biopsy obtained and it is shown. Flow cytometry shows the following findings. TDT is negative. That itself rules out acute lymphoplastic leukemia. CD5, CD23 is negative. CD10, 19, 20, surface immunoglobin, all are positive. What is the likely diagnosis? And uh, I won't be diagnosing ALC, anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Why? Because in ALCL, you're going to have ALK positivity in most cases. That will be the clue in exam, ALK positivity. And of course, CD30 will be positive. This is very, very important. Even though CD15 negative, that differentiates from the classic Hodgkin disease, but 30 will be positive and ALK will be positive, which is very, very characteristic of anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So that clue is not there. So I'm not going to make a diagnosis of ALCL. Generally, in a 12-year-old child, I'm not going to make a diagnosis of DLBC because it's very common in adults. Plus, at the same time, it's... I would say as diagnosis of exclusion. Okay, so it's not basically going to be diagnosed based on any particular uh, cytogenic picture or uh, molecular picture. So, but if you look at the biopsy that they have given, so you can see a lot of vacuolations in the cytoplasm of these blasts. So, which clearly tells that this is a Burkitt type leukemia, or you can say it's a Burkitt type lymphoma. So, this is Burkitt's lymphoma. Going by the age and the other presentation, the biopsy picture, it is Burkitt's. And 31st question, which of the following is false in patient with thyroid eye disease? It can lead to vision loss, of course, right? Response to vision symptoms is adjuvant to thyrotoxic response. This is wrong because uh, the vision symptoms can be treated by like completely different means. For example, if it's a mild to moderate disease, you can go for just supportive management. Maybe you can add selenium. It's found to be effective. And for moderate to severe disease, you have to use steroids. Dexamethasone or prednisolone. That's the best treatment. And of course, in very severe disease, as an adjunct to steroids, you can use a newer drug called as teprotumumab, which is an anti-IGF-1 receptor blocker that gives a tremendous response in patients with 
thyroiditis. So response to vision symptoms is not adjuvant to thyroidoxic response because the treatment are completely dissociated. And no specs classification is used. That's correct. And 10% of youth thyroid patients can have eye involvement. This is something that we have discussed so many times in a lecture. I told you there is something called youth thyroid graves and we see a lot of patients in practice where patients will have only extra thyroid manifestations but patients TFTs may be completely normal. Coming to the 32nd question, which of the following is an indication for short course bedaquine containing MDR regime for the treatment of tuberculosis? It's a kind of a tough question, I would say, because uh, you need to know all the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the short course bedaquine containing MDR regime. Let us go one by one. Option A, stage refams and resistance with CAT-G and INHA mutation. This is kind of a wrong statement because in the inclusion criteria, if you see patient should be refams and resistance and it's okay to have H resistance, but that H resistance must be either CAT-G or INHA mutation, not both. If you have both, it's kind of an exclusion. So I can exclude option A. Option B states extra pulmonary TB with hydrocephalus. This is wrong because in any severe form of TB and extra pulmonary TB, uh, short course bedaquine containing MDR regime is excluded. We cannot use. And even in children less than five years of age and in pregnant women, you cannot use this regime. Option C states rifampicin resistant but fluoroquinolone sensitive TB. This is one of the standard inclusions for short course bedaquine containing MDR regime. So this is the right answer for this question. Rifampicin sensitive TB of course is excluded because if it's rifampicin sensitive, you can use the standard drugs like HRZT and not the MDR regime containing bedaquine. It's really not required. So obviously option C is going to be the right answer for this question. Coming to the 33rd question, a 65 year old patient presents with symptoms of bone pain, anemia, hypercalcemia, and renal impairment, which means this is crab and this must be multiple myeloma. Subsequent bone marrow biopsy confirms multiple myeloma. And treatment was initiated, which of the following is most likely associated with the reactivation of herpes zoster. So, even though this is something that we have not really discussed in our discussion, but you can know now. So, one of the important drugs that's commonly associated with the reactivation of herpes zoster at any stage of multiple myeloma, irrespective of the background regime used, is going to be bortezomib. So, botulinum. I've told you in classes that this can cause severe peripheral neuropathy, but other drugs in the same group like carfilzomib or exazomib is not going to cause that. In fact, it's going to have less uh, severe peripheral neuropathy with the other drugs. But with botulinum, you get very severe peripheral neuropathy. Another thing that you can add up is botulinum is something that can increase the reactivation risk of herpes zoster. And uh, to avoid that, we're gonna use acyclovir as a standard prophylactic regimen. The dose will be 400 milligram once a day to prevent reactivation of herpes zoster and this is irrespective of background regime used and irrespective of the stage of multiple myeloma. Lenaldomide is not going to cause that problem. Daratumab is a newer drug. It can be used in high-risk patients with high-risk cytogenetics as an add-on. It's an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody and melphalan is something that we don't uh, really use in modern practice that commonly unless until the disease is really severe and refractory. So right answer for this is option A, botizomib. Increased risk of reactivation of herpes zoster prophylaxis, acyclovir 400 mg once a day. 34th question, a 40-year-old alcoholic patient was brought to the emergency in an unconscious state. His blood sugar was 49 mg per deciliter, which means patient is hypoglycemic. What is the management? We have discussed this time and again. Any altered mental status or unconsciousness in an alcoholic patient is going to be vernicase and keflopathy unless proved otherwise. And we know that even if the patient is having hypoglycemia, in such situations, it's always better to start with time in first followed by IV dextrose. This is very, very important. We have discussed hundreds of times. And I don't know why still some of the students have answered it wrong. So it must be time in followed by dextrose. There's no doubt about that. Because if you give dextrose first, it can take up more and more time in for the metabolism of glucose and that can result in worsening of Wernicke's features which is something that we don't want so the right answer for this question is going to be option A. Coming to 35th question, a 50 year old lady with multiple nasal polyps, rhinosinusitis and asthma came to the dentist for a procedure. She recently developed an allergic reaction to aspirin that was prescribed after undergoing a dermatologic procedure. Which of the following statements is incorrect regarding her condition? So here we are talking about a condition called as AERD that is aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease which is going to obey a triad called as Samtas triad which is a triad of aspirin hypersensitivity, nasal polyposis and asthma. So this is due to disorder in the Cox pathway. So if there is a disorder in the Cox pathway there will be a movement of most of the arachidonic acid towards the LOX pathway which is going to produce lots and lots of leukotriene. Suppose if you give any NSA including aspirin, any NSAID for that matters. It's going to block the Cox pathway. It's going to increase the abnormality in the Cox pathway so that everything will be diverted towards the Cox pathway resulting in excessive leukotriene production. That is the pathophysiology of ARD or Samtas triad. 
so you have to technically or theoretically give a leukotriene receptor antagonist as a treatment so it can be treated by monoglucose is a right statement she would have got this reaction with any other coxone inhibitors too this is absolutely right any other NSA would have caused this problem and aspirin desensation therapy can be useful is also correct but option a she has sensitivity only to aspirin is wrong because it's not just aspirin I told you multiple times anything that blocks the cox can result in ard in these patients of course who are like kind of hypersensitive coming to 36 the question a 25 year old male who is a known case of bronchiasma presented for a routine follow-up pft was done earlier his fe1 was 70 percentage which improved to 83 percentage after bronchodilator nebulization like salbutamol which means this is clearly telling you that you're dealing with a case of bronchial asthma because it's a dynamic obstruction. He was already on MD albuterol daily, which is nothing but salbutamol. On questioning, it seems like he's symptomatic for at least two times per week and he's getting up in the nights due to symptoms at least once per week. So clearly this patient is symptomatic and is not doing well with this albuterol alone. On examination, he has scattered ronchi as well which adds on to the disease burden. What should be done for this patient? So we have discussed so many times that in asthma, the most important treatment is that inhaled corticosteroid component. You have to address the inflammation. COPD, that inhaled corticosteroid is not that important, but in asthma, it's really, really important. So even in dreams, if somebody asks me, so what will be the best treatment? What will, what will I do for this patient? I'm going to add an inhaled corticosteroid like fluidic acid, cyclosonate, or even budisonate. Shifting to a long-acting beta agonist like MD salmonitrol two times a day may work, but it doesn't address the inflammation component. It's not really preferred in modern practice. So, as a part of reliever therapy, we are going to use a llama that is formatrol with like a low dose ICS. So that's the standard regime, even as a part of reliever, because you have to address the inflammation and asthma. So I'm not going to risk this patient taking only a bronchodilator without a steroid. Add prednisolone 10 milligram, absolutely not required because this patient is not in the step five, step, step six of the algorithm. So in that case, maybe I can add a short course oral corticosteroids, but generally we don't do that unless we don't have any other options. And short course steroids are generally used in patients who are having acute exacerbation or probably in step five, step six, not in this patient because it is associated with a lot of side effects. And continue. The current management is also wrong because this patient is clearly not happy with this clinical picture. So I need to do something. So it, yeah, the best option will be to add an inhaled steroid. 37th question, a child present with following deformity, labs show the following serum calcium normal, PTH normal, phosphorus low, alkaline phosphorus raised. What is the probable defect? And they have given the characteristic bowing of the legs, which is so typical of rickets. So four options we have hypophosphatemic rickets, vitamin D dependent rickets, type 1 which is probably due to 25 hydroxylase deficiency and vitamin D dependent rickets type 2 which is probably due to uh, vitamin D receptor defect. It's kind of resistance to vitamin D, very difficult to treat and we have nutritional rickets which is uh, nothing but a nutritional deficiency of vitamin D. How to differentiate? It's actually a kind of a tough question. So I mean it might look apparently simple because uh, people think like phosphorus is low, alkaline phosphorus is rise so I can make a diagnosis of hypophosphatemic rickets. But trust me, this low phosphorus and raised alkaline phosphorus can be seen in all of these problems. Hypophosphatemic rickets, VDDR1, VDDR2 as well as a nutritional rickets. So that doesn't give you any clue. So what's going to give you the clue is going to be the calcium and the PTH. Because if you look at the calcium, it can be normal in patients with nutritional rickets. In fact, presentation with normal calcium is so characteristic of nutritional rickets. And even in hypophosphatemic rickets, the calcium levels will be normal. So calcium being normal can be seen in nutritional rickets as well as in hypophosphatemic rickets. And in VDDR, definitely the calcium levels will be low. There's no doubt about that. So that's excluded. Easily we can exclude. So now we have two differential diagnoses: Hypophosphatemic rickets versus nutritional rickets. How will you differentiate? So with the help of PTH, the PTH levels will be definitely raised in patients with nutrition rickets and PTH levels will be definitely raised in patients with VDDR also. But in hypophosphatemic rickets or vitamin D resistant rickets, the PTH levels will also be normal. That's a very, very important point. So I will say the clincher here is going to be the PTH and of course the calcium as well. Not the low phosphorus and alkaline phosphorus. Even though this question, as I said, may look apparently simple, but it's not really simple. The right answer for this question is hypophosphatemic rickets though. 
38th question which of the following drugs is used for the reversal of muscle relaxation caused by becuronium we have discussed this time and again in our critical care section if you look at and for muscle relaxation we use two drugs in modern practice one is going to be the neostigmin which doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier that's why we use it's not physostigmin because it does cross the blood-brain barrier and ribastigmin and galantamine doesn't have anything to do with uh, your reversal of muscle relaxation because these are drugs which are central acetylcholinesterase inhibitors which are used in uh, conditions like dementia especially alzheimer disease to improve the cognitive scores and what about sagamedics this is i think the second or third time in the last two years that's been asked in one pan india entrance exam so sagamedics is specifically used for reversal of vacuronium and rocuronium so why Sugamdex is preferred in these drugs and not neostigmin. The reason is neostigmin also can provide reversal with uh, vecurinum and rocurinum, but Sugamdex is going to provide a faster reversal. You can say like 17 times faster reversal and the overall surgical time as well as the reversal time is going to be much lower with Sugamdex. So the complication rates also is going to come down with Sugamdex. That's why they prefer Sugamdex for uh, those patients who are under neuromuscular blockade with vecurinum or rocurinum. So that's the right answer for this question. Other things are obviously ruled out. And there's another drug which can be a potential future question that also something that we have discussed in a critical care section that is Calabedion, which is a kind of a pan reversal agent. It can work for anything and everything including scolid. 39th question. What is the mechanism of action of Aparapirand? We know Aparapirand is a drug that we commonly use in uh, patients who are having chemotherapy associated nausea and vomiting, especially for patients who are at high risk for example, patients who are receiving platinum compounds like cisplatin, for those people, it's a standard part of the regime to prevent nausea and vomiting. So what is aparapirand? It's a neurokinin 1 antagonist. Option C. 40th question. A patient is found to uh, be having hot and dry skin, found on a railway station, raised temperature, dilated pupils and slurred speech. Which of the following is the most likely cause? Alcohol intoxication cannot produce something like this because alcohol intoxication usually will produce cold skin patient may be sweating a lot that's how like we see people in the emergency with alcohol intoxication so that's not going to be the case opiate overdose simple they're going to be hypothermic low respiratory rate and they're going to have uh, like pinpoint pupils so obviously that's ruled out opc poisoning again it's going to have cold energy crisis patient will be cold sweating a lot pupils will be constricted meiosis they're going to have the typical dumbbells feature, diarrhea, urination, meiosis, bronchorrhea, bradycardia, emesis, lacrimation, salivation, secretions everywhere. So that's OPC poisoning. So that's not the case here. And datura poisoning is the right answer because datura is going to produce that characteristic anticholinergic toxidrome where the patient will be having fever, maybe high BP, maybe tachycardia but the most important feature is the dry skin so characteristic and of course it's going to produce atropin like effect you're going to have uh, the altered mental status and you're going to have dilated pupils and the most important other point that's not given but still it's important is going to be the retention part the urinary and the bowel retention part very important in that poisoning 41st question a woman at 30 weeks of gestation is diagnosed to have deep vein thrombosis which of the following is the most appropriate treatment option when it comes to venous thromboembolism in pregnancy the gold standard treatment of choice is going to be low molecular weight heparin in case if the patient is having heparin induced thrombocytopenia or something uh, which says that you cannot use heparin like heparin allergy in the past so in that case maybe you can try fondapenex but it's not approved for this purpose Clear? Apixaban definitely cannot use because DOACs are contraindicated in both pregnancy as well as in lactation. Warfarin, even though it can be used in both pregnancy and lactation, but still when it comes to venous thromboembolism, LMWH is what is preferred. 42nd question. A patient presents with hypertension has experienced a few episodes of renal colic, which diuretic is the most appropriate to use. Simple, straightforward. We know that... Uh, loop diuretics is going to increase urinary calcium but thiazid diuretics are something that's going to reduce urinary calcium so in patients with hypertension and uh, those who are having history of renal stones especially if it's a calcium related renal stone then it's okay to give thiazid diuretics as the first line drug because these drugs reduce urinary calcium so theoretically they can reduce the formation of urinary stones especially the calcium urinary stones Coming to 43rd question, a 70 year old lady present with history of memory loss and present with urinary incontinence what is the appropriate treatment? They have not mentioned about the type of urinary incontinence because there are lots and lots in practice. And there are 
two commonest types of urinary incontinence. One is going to be the stress incontinence and second is the urge incontinence. Stress incontinence, the first line treatment is going to be pelvic flow strengthening exercises, typically Kegel exercises. And drug treatment is not really warranted in patients who are having stress incontinence. You can try duloxetine off-label. It's one of the preferred drugs if you want to use drug. But apart from that, none of the other drugs. In the past, they have been saying that alpha agonists can be beneficial in stress incontinence. But right now, because of their ineffectiveness, uh, most of the guidelines say like it's better not to use any drug. If at all you want to use, use duloxetine. But for urge incontinence, or we can call it as overactive bladder, we have a lot of drugs. Like for example, we can use beta-3 agonists, which are preferred. One of the standard beta-3 agonists that we use in practice right now is Mirabigron. I will have the brand name called Mirago, even though I'm not here to promote any brands. Just want to say. And we can use some anticholinergic drugs also. The safer ones will be drugs like Trospium or maybe uh, Solifenacin, Darifenacin, and sometimes even Tolterodin. So, your yeah, right answer is going to be the Tolterodin. So, that's the only thing I can mark here. The rest of the other things are not used in incontinence at all because Ipratropium is a drug that's used in nebulized form in uh, patients with acute expansion of bronchial asthma or COPD because it's a short-acting drug. It's a SAMA, that is short-acting muscarinic antagonist. Tilenzepin is used in some countries to reduce the gastric acid secretion and hence for peptic ulcer disease. Tropicamide, we know it's eye drop, so I'm not going to use in this patient, of course. So going to the 44th question, a 44-year-old man present with fatigue and hemoptysis, his current hemoglobin is 8 grams per deciliter, which means patient is anemic. One week ago, patient had a hemoglobin of 12, which means it's a very drastic fall. His bronchial lavage is reddish in color and his serum creatinine was 1.7 milligrams per deciliter. So hemoptysis, reddish bulb and a sudden drop in hemoglobin must suggest a diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Or we can simply call this a pulmonary hemorrhage. And this patient is having AKA as well, creatinine is 1.7. So this is a pulmonary renal syndrome, which is very commonly caused by either good patches syndrome or probably by some ANCA associated vasculitis. They said biopsy of the kidney reveals positive of immune complexes, which clearly says that it is not good pasture syndrome or it's not immune complex vasculitis. It must be some ANCA said vasculitis. What is the likely diagnosis? The only ANCA said vasculitis among the given options is going to be microscopic polyangitis, and that's the right answer. Easy one. 45th question, which of the following is not true regarding one Willebrand disease? Right answer for this question is easy one. It's uh, option A, type 1 is more severe. It's wrong because type 1 is only a partial quantitative deficiency of one Willebrand factor. So you can easily treat with desmopressin itself. Desmopressin tend to increase the release of one Willebrand factor from the variable pleural bodies in the endothelium. So that's enough for treating type 1 one Willebrand disease. It's mild and less severe. And it's the most common form. 85% of the cases are going to have type 1 disease. Type 3 is more severe. That's right. Type 3 has very low levels. In fact, absent von Willebrand factor. And most of the time, type 3 can mimic a hemophilia because these patients will have very, very low levels of factor 8 as well because von Willebrand factor is very, very important for carrying factor 8 and stabilizing factor 8. And type 2 is a qualitative defect. That's perfectly. There are different types of type 2. But yes, type 2 is not a quantitative problem, but rather it's a qualitative defect of von Willebrand factor. Right answer for this question is option A. Let us move on to the 46th question. A 30-year-old sexually active woman presents with dysuria, lower abdominal pain and increased urinary frequency. Urine culture was done and it grew staphylococcus saprophyticus with a colony count of 10 power 4 colony forming units per ml. What is the management? So remember, according to the current consensus, if the patient is symptomatic, and if the colony count is more than 10 power 3, 1000, this is enough to make a diagnosis of UT. If you're collecting a midstream sample, a proper sample, or maybe early morning midstream sample, doesn't matter. But if the patient is symptomatic and the urine grows at least 1000 colony forming units, that is equal to UTI. So this patient is having 10 power 4 CFU per ml, which means, and the patient is symptomatic also. If you can look at like patients having dysuria and lower abdominal pain and increased urinary frequency. So this is UTI. There is nothing else. And what is the definition of like significant bacteria? Still, the definition is 10 to the power of 5 colony forming units per ml. That can be used in patients who are asymptomatic. So here the patient is symptomatic. So 10 power 3 and above. It is UTI. So right, right answer for this question is option A, it's a diagnosis of UTI. Coming to the 47th question, I think this is the last question in the first shift. 
A 34-year-old patient present with cough and shortness of breath subsequent evaluation revealed a diagnosis of COPD and chest radiograph was obtained which showed a pan asinar emphysema. So we have discussed time and again that if the patient is young and if he's having emphysema, if the patient is a never smoker and having emphysema, if the patient is having emphysema and liver disease together, if the patient is having family history of emphysema, if the patient is having lower lobe emphysema, and if the patient is having pan asinar emphysema, the only diagnosis that you're going to make is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and that's the right answer for this question. Elastase uh, can be acting in too much in patients with emphysema and that's the basic pathophysiology that is proteus antiproteus imbalance but that's not the primary pathology here chymotrypsin is a digestive enzyme nothing to do with emphysema here surfactant deficiency typically leads to your ARDS and highly membrane disease especially in the newborns and that has nothing to do with emphysema as of now so right answer is option A that's done and we are entering the second shift First question, an athlete was planning for some kind of physical activity sport, comes for a routine health checkup. All routine investigation turned out to be normal with non-signal TCG findings except for the fact that he has an increased, maybe a slightly, ever so slightly increased PR interval. It's 0.21 seconds. So you know the normal PR interval is going to be 0.12 to 0.2 seconds or I can say 120 to 200 milliseconds if you convert to milliseconds. Which of the following is most likely? However, ever so slightly, even if it's increased, doesn't matter. I'm going to make a diagnosis of first degree AV block. I can say that this can be completely physiological in an athlete. I'm not saying this is normal, but this is completely physiological in an athlete because of the high vagal tone. But I will not say normal ECG. According to the diagnostic criteria, it is a first degree AV block. That's it period. So second question, a 55-year-old hypertensive patient arrives at emergency department with sudden severe chest pain related to the back. This clearly tells that we are probably dealing with a case of aortic dissection. You know, the characteristic chest pain, tearing, ripping pain related to the back interscapular region. It is dissection. On physical examination, there is a noticeable difference in uh, blood pressure between the arms are unequal. Radial pulses are observed, which further strengthens our diagnosis of aortic dissection. CT angiogram is done and is shown which of the following is the most appropriate initial management of this patient. If you look at the CT angiogram, you can notice that there is a dissection, there is an intimal tear in the descending iota. The ascending iota and the arch of iota is fine, which means it's clearly a Stanford type B dissection. So, you know, in Stanford type B dissections, unless and until you have some specific indications we are going to go for conservative management that is aggressive blood pressure control with espanol plus or minus nitroprusside and of course close monitoring for complications right all right question number three a 55 year old patient presents to emergency department with acute shortness of breath heart rate 120 tachycardic bp 80 60 hypotensive and echo was done reveals a diastolic collapse of the right ventricle we all know that and we have discussed so many times in our lectures again. So whenever you have a diastolic RARV collapse, this is equal to tamponade, unless proved otherwise. X-ray was done and is shown, which clearly tells that the cardiac salute as a whole is enlarged. Even though certain area of the cardiac salute is, the shape is maintained, but as a whole, the cardiac salute is enlarged. This is also called as money bag heart, which tells you that there is a large pericardial effusion in this guy. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? Of course, initiating diuretic therapy is going to be catastrophic because the RV filling and RA filling will be already very bad in this patient because of the diastolic collapse. And that too, in hypotension, this is catastrophic. This is going to kill this patient. I am not going to start. And IABP is not going to help you in any way. It can be useful in patients who are having mechanical complications during myocardial infection or probably in patients who are having uh, cardiogenic shock, so in that situation, I mean, and, and MI, in those situations, IABP may be helpful, but definitely not in this case. And ventricular assist device can be useful in patients who are having like refractory heart failure, especially LV failure, but we are not talking about those things. So easy one, the right answer for this question is going to be perform pericardial synthesis. Even removal of 50 ml of fluid may be life-saving in such patients. Coming to fourth question, a 65-year-old male patient is brought to the emergency department after collapsing at home. On arrival, the patient is found to be pulseless and the ECG shows the following rhythm. What are the best next step in the management of this patient? You can notice that this patient is having a monomorphic wide complex tachycardia. And this is nothing but ventricular tachycardia. So in a patient who is having cardiac arrest, and ventricular tachycardia, the next step is to shock. You have to defibrillate the patient because in 
patients who are in arrest, there's no point in synchronized DC cardioversion. You have to defibrillate a non-synchronized random shock. And you have to continue chest compression, right? So many times we have a reflex temptation to look at the pulse, look at the monitor, but no. You have to defibrillate and continue chest compression for two minutes and then recheck the rhythm. That's the protocol. Right? The right answer for this question is option A. Going to fifth question, a hypertensive patient presents with irregularly irregular pulse and loud P2 on auscultation. Upon examination of the jugular venous pulse, which of the following is most likely to be observed in this patient? The moment they say irregularly irregular pulse, which means we are dealing with a case of atrial fibrillation. In atrial fibrillation, you are going to have absent A wave. They have cleverly tried to trick you by giving a loud P2 which indicates pulmonary hypertension we are going to have a large A wave but remember even if the patient is having pulmonary hypertension if you have atrial fibrillation you are going to only end up with an absent A wave that's very very important we have discussed time and again the four no's in atrial fibrillation what are the four no's in atrial fibrillation no A wave in the JVP no P wave in the ECG no pre-systolic accentuation in the setting of mitral stenosis and you won't get an S4 at all because S4 is due to atrial kick against a stiff ventricle. So four no's, atrial fibrillation, don't forget. Sixth question, which of the following is the most common cause of death in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? I don't know why this question was asked but nevertheless the answer for this question is going to be respiratory failure. That's it. Seventh question, a 45-year-old male present with a fever of 102 degree Fahrenheit with foul smelling sputum for five days on ask examination. Patient is having clubbing and chest x-ray shown below what is the most likely diagnosis. The chest x-ray is so clear that you are having a huge lesion in the right lung that is showing air fluid levels and it's a kind of a thick walled cavity. I think you can see that. It's a thick walled cavity with air fluid levels. This is the key point that we have been discussing so many times that this is a characteristic feature of lung abscess. Some people I've gotten confused with empyema, but remember empyema is something that's going to uh, like be seen on the side of the lungs, not in the center of the lungs like this, right? It'll be seen on the sides and in the CT scan you have something called a split pleura sign. On the side you will see empyema, okay, because it's something that's limited to the pleural space. But here the lesion is right in the lung, the center of the lung. So this must be something related to a process that involves the parenchyma of the lung. In this case, it's lung abscess. It's definitely not pneumothorax. I, I know that. I mean, you will easily rule out that. Coming to eighth question, this is another question based on lights criteria, but I'm not very sure uh, whether two separate questions were there in two shifts with regards to lights criteria or only one question asked in either of the shifts, but it really doesn't matter. So this is also a feature of an exudate and the right answer for this question is going to be tuberculosis because this is only exudate among the four options. Remaining three is going to be translated. Of course, even if you don't know the question, you can still answer it based on a knowledge that other three is going to be uh, translated and the only odd man out here is going to be tuberculosis that's going to produce an exudative effusion. Going to the ninth question, a 64 year old man presents with uh, acute epigastric pain and nausea lab report show an increase in lipase levels, which means we are dealing with a case of pancreatitis because lipase is very specific. Uh, he has received two liters of fluids during admission and three days after stabilization, he develops sudden breathlessness, chest x is shown what is the likely diagnosis? What we have in the chest x-ray, bilateral infiltrates, kind of symmetric. In the setting of acute pancreatitis, this must be ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is kind of very common. And in fact, it's the common cause of death in patients with acute pancreatitis, especially if the pancreatitis is very severe. And what is ARDS? It's a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And as you know, in any non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, PCWP is supposed to be normal, at least theoretically. So it cannot be increased. Increased PCWP suggests a cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Pulmonary thromboembolism is not going to present like bilateral infiltrates like this. And aspiration immunitis usually presents uh, as one side infiltrate only to begin with. It can produce ARDS though, but usually it happens in patients who are in altered mental status or those who are having history of aspiration, very sick. Okay, so this is not going to be the case. So right answer for this question is non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which means we are dealing with the case of ARDS here. Tenth question, a 60 year old Patient presents with left-sided arm and leg weakness, right-sided facial paralysis and horizontal case palsy. Based on the clinical presentation, which of the following is most consistent with the diagnosis? We have discussed these things like plenty of times in our mission classes, in our revision sessions and even our main videos. I, I mean, in every single lecture. So I have not crossed the neurology chapter without discussing on stroke localization. And we know what is Millard-Gubler syndrome? 
Milad Gobla syndrome is a combination of 6th and 7th nerve palsy. Along with that, patient will be having contralateral hemiparesis. Right. So that's the clue here. So Milad. So you have 7 letters. 7th nerve palsy, Gobla. 6 letters. 6th nerve palsy with contralateral hemiparesis. And what about Foville syndrome? Foville syndrome is characterized by involvement of MLF or PPRF. So the only thing that separates Millard Gubbler from Fovils is the fact that Foville syndrome is going to have horizontal gaze palsy. So that is the buzzword here. That's a clue here. So that tells you this is a case of Foville syndrome. So you have seventh nerve palsy, you have horizontal gaze palsy because of PPRF or MLF involvement. Along with that, you will have contralateral hemiparesis. Locked-in state is going to present in a very, very different way. So they will have quadriparesis, not weakness only on one side and Wallenberg syndrome will not even have motor problems. It's a pure sensory issue. It's a lateral medullary syndrome. And coming to 11th question. 70 year old man with history of recurrent falls presents with headache and confusion. CT scan of the patient is shown. Which of the following is correct? So what CT shows? It shows a kind of a crescent shaped hypodensity on the lateral side of the head. So which means it must be a subdural hemorrhage. Why it is black? Because it's chronic. In acute SDH, you will have kind of hyper intense area, but it's blackish means it must be a chronic SDH. The right answer for this question is going to be chronic SDH, which is very, very common in patients who are old and those who are on antiplatelets and anticoagulants. And SDH is something that can happen because of trivial trauma, especially in old patients. They don't even remember the event most of the times. And chronic SDH is something that's well known for its presentation with dementia. Twelfth question. A patient presents with headaches, confusion and has recently been diagnosed with a brain tumor. MRI of the brain revealed a cerebellar mass. Which means it's a kind of a cerebellar tumor. We're dealing with family history reveals occurrences of both brain and kidney tumors. Which means dealing with brain tumors and probably an RCC. Which of the following syndromes is going to be associated with this clinical presentation. Of course, brain tumor, that is cerebellar tumor with kidney tumor like RCC. The only thing that you can diagnose is von hippel lindorff syndrome. There's nothing else that's going to fit into the diagnosis. The moment they say cerebellar tumor or cerebellar hemangioblastoma or neurocutaneous syndrome, you're going to make a diagnosis of VHL. Simple. Thirteenth question. A 30-year-old patient presents with GTCS, generally tonic clonic seizures, was admitted. CECT is shown. Which of the following can be useful in establishing the diagnosis? So what you see in CECT, you can see a single ring enhancing lesion near the palato occipital region, right? So there are multiple DDs for ring enhancing lesions. We have brain abscess, but the history and clinical presentation is not compatible with the diagnosis of brain abscess. And of course, we have primary sinus lymphoma, which is very commonly seen in HIV patients. And we have uh, tuberculosis, that's tuberculoma, and we have neurocysticercosis. The most important DD, I would say, in this guy is going to be tuberculoma versus neurocysticercosis. Toxoplasma is also in the DDs, but toxoplasma will be usually seen in HIV patients. But here the real DD in such young patients is going to be tuberculoma versus neurocysticercosis. To differentiate that, I can probably use NMR spectroscopy. You know, in uh, tuberculoma, NMR spectroscopy or nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy is going to show a characteristic lipid and or lactate peak but in neurocysticercosis it's going to show multiple amino acid peaks this is something that we have clearly discussed in most of our sessions including mission classes as well as in the qr videos pet scan maybe if i'm thinking of a tumor then fine here my suspicion is not tumor here and b scan of both eyes can be useful if you are suspecting intraocular neurocysticercosis sometimes cysts can be seen in the eyes in the vitreous in the posterior part of the eyes so that can be uh, seen with b scan of uh, eyes it's nothing but ultrasound of the eyes cbnat of csf is used to confirm uh, tb meningitis many times it uses an adjunctive test but here our suspicion is not tb meningitis patient is not having features of meningism right so we are thinking about tuberculoma so here most of the time the cb nod of the csf is likely to be negative so i will go for nmr spectroscopy but still this question i would say like kind of ambiguous because i don't know exact language what the examiner has given in the exams 14 question a 45 year old patient with history of wilson disease presents with neurological manifestations which of the following is the best diagnostic modality so when they use the term best gold standard it's absolutely only one thing that you can answer that's going to be the hepatic copper content you're going to do liver biopsy 
And if you prove that the hepatic copper is more than 250 microgram per gram of dry weight, that's the gold standard for diagnosis of Wilson disease. Even though you do have other conditions that can produce increased hepatic, increased amounts of hepatic copper, like chronic cold static conditions, but the gold standard is going to be hepatic copper assay. Serum celloplasmin, of course, is going to be reduced in patients with Wilson disease, but that's a screening test. It's just a screening test and it's not very specific. Urinary copper excretion, of course, it will be increased. And if you want to know the absolute value, serum celloplasm will be less than 20 and urinary copper will be more than 100 micrograms in 24 hours. That is kind of almost diagnostic of Wilson disease, but still the gold standard, the best is going to be liver biopsy and hepatic copper content assessment. Serum copper is one of the useless tests in the diagnosis of Wilson disease. There are multiple different types of serum, serum copper. You have total copper, free copper, total copper will be uh, reduce free copper may be increased but that's totally unreliable we're not going to use it for diagnosis so right answer is option c coming to 15th question which of the following conditions is most likely based on lab value shown patient is having acidosis ph is 7.28 normal sodium but patient is having hypokalemia and patient is having a chloride of 113 bicarbonate of 12 which means patient is having metabolic acidosis burn of 3 creatinine of 0.2 which means burn creatinine is normal so if you look at the anion gap, the anion gap is normal, less than 12, which clearly says that we are dealing with a nagma. And that itself rules out respiratory acidosis. Option D cannot be the answer because this is a case of nagma. Urinalysis shows urinary pH of 9, which means we are dealing with an alkaline urine. And because the patient is having hypokalemia, type 4 RTA is ruled out because in type 4 RTA you are going to have hyperkalemia. Because it's due to aldosterone deficiency or aldosterone resistance. So only DD right now is between type 1 versus type 2 RTA. But I would say type 1 RTA is the likely diagnosis here because of the urinary pH. Because we know in patients who are having type 2 proximal RTA, the urine can be acidified and pH sometimes can be acidic. But when it comes to type 1 RTA, you cannot have an acidic urine. Impossible. Because the distal nephron is the one that acidifies the urine. It is the one that's going to excrete H+. Without that, you can't acidify the urine and the urinary pH is almost always going to be alkaline. It's going to be more than 5.5 to 6. So just with the urinary pH, I can clearly, concretely make a diagnosis of type 1 distal RTA. End of discussion. Question number 16. A 40-year-old male presents with altered mental status, tachycardia, tachypnea and hypertension after consuming an unknown substance on evaluation. Patient is having HUGMA, high and end gap metabolic acidosis and hypocalcemia, which of the following is likely to be the reason for his presentation. Iron doesn't present with hypocalcemia. Methanol poisoning can present with blindness and possibly AKI, but not with hypocalcemia. Okay, digoxin doesn't present in this way. Okay, digoxin has a very, very different presentation. One of the important clues will be the xanthopsia, yellow colored vision. The right answer is ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol is going to produce hypocalcemia because one of its metabolites is oxalic acid and that can produce calcium oxalate, especially monohydrate crystals and that can cause even AKI. So that's the one that fits into the presentation and any alcohol poisoning. If you take it, it's going to present with HAGMA and raised osmolar gap as well. 17th question, 22 year old woman with history of eclampsia is being administered with a maintenance dose of magnesium sulfate. When will you stop magnesium sulfate? So first sign of magnesium excess or hypermagnesemia in a patient who's receiving max self is going to be loss of knee jerk. The knee jerk is present, that's fine. That's not an indication to stop. Respiratory rate less than 12 is an indication because the next thing that's going to happen is suppression of respiratory drive depressed respiration. So you're going to have a respiratory rate of less than 12. That means it's toxicity. You have to stop. Either patient's respiratory rate is 12 to 20. It's normal, which means you're not going to stop. You're going to continue. And serum magnesium level of 6 milliequivalents per liter is not an indication to stop because that target therapeutic magnesium levels in a patient who's receiving max self is going to be 5 to 7 milliequivalents per liter. River T jerk will be lost when the magnesium levels are in the range of 7 to 10 milliequivalents per liter. So respiratory depression will occur if the levels are in the range of 10 to 13 milliequivalents per liter and cardiac conduction defects will happen if the magnesium levels exceed 15 milliequivalents per liter and asystole and cardiac arrest can happen if the magnesium levels exceed 25 milliequivalents per liter. So right answer obviously is going to be urine output of 15 ml per hour because the criteria 
to continue max self in a patient who's having preeclampsia is going to be a urine output of at least 100 ml in four hours. If you calculate this patient is having uh, only like 60 ml over the period of four hours if you extrapolate and see. So definitely it's less than 100 ml in four hours. So that becomes an indication to stop max self in this lady. 18th question. 50 year old male present with headache, palpations, and hypertension. On evaluation is urinary, vandal, mandly, acid, and catecholamines are elevated, which means we are dealing with a case of a pheochromocytoma. Imaging revealed an adrenal mass, and patient underwent surgery and resection. Histology the mass was shown. You can notice that this is the characteristic cell balance pattern where the malignant cells will be arranged with in cell nests, right? The tumor cells will be arranged in the form of nest with the surrounding sustained dacla cells, which will be S100 positive, of course. Which of the following is true regarding the condition? So only 10% of pheochromocytomas occur in children. So it's not something that's going to most commonly occur in children. Mostly malignant is also wrong. But only according to modern practice, not 10%, but 15 to 20% can be malignant. Mostly bilateral is also wrong because only 10 to 12% are going to be bilateral. That's a rule of tens. And of course, it's going to be seen in men too here. So in men too, one of the characteristic tumors that's going to occur is going to be MTC along with pheochromocytoma. Come to 19th question, a 34-year-old patient present with lethargy and tiredness on examination, he has hyperpigmentation around the lips, BP is low, heart rate is high, sodium is low, potassium is high, what is the most appropriate treatment? So this is a case of adrenal insufficiency. In fact, this is an Addisonian crisis, a primary adrenal insufficiency. In primary adrenal insufficiency, there will be deficiency of both glucocorticoids and mandelocorticoids. So you are going to give a combination of hydrocortisone and fluorocortisone. Only dexamethasone can be tried if the patient is having a secondary adrenal insufficiency, but here uh, the hyperpigmentation is there, crisis is there, electrolyte imbalance is there, especially hyperkalemia. Those things suggest a primary adrenal insufficiency. So go for the combination of both gluco and mineralocorticoids. Right answer is B. Come to the 20th question. 45 year old patient present with large pretty hands, macroglossy, and prominent frontal bossing. The patient also re reports increasing shoe size and difficulty wearing ring that was previously fit. Considering the clinical features, which are the following test is the most appropriate initial investigation. I can easily rule out random growth hormone levels because it's the most useless test because growth hormone is going to have pulsatile secretion and random growth hormone levels doesn't make any sense. And GHRH levels are also going to be not very useful in initial stages and it can be used very, very rarely in very specific cases if you're suspecting ectopic GHRH secretion. Otherwise, it's not going to be of any use. The only confusion is between option B and option D because they're asking about initial test. I'll go for age matched IGF-1 levels because IGF-1 is going to be the screening test we have discussed tons of times already. And why it's age matched? Because IGF-1 levels are supposed to be low in old people as a physiological entity. And if you use the same IGF-1 cutoff as for younger patients and older people, you will end up missing out on acromegaly because the level that you see as normal may be in fact higher because the old people, it's supposed to be learned using a younger cutoff. So that's why you should use age match IGF-1 levels in practice. And what about option D? That is growth hormone levels after two hours of administration of 75 gram glucose. It's a kind of confirmatory test, not the screening test. So what will be the normal values? Normally, after giving 75 gram glucose, your growth hormone levels to, should be suppressed to undetectable levels. That is less than one nanogram per ml according to traditional assays. But with the newer assays, which are very highly sensitive, the cutoff will be less than 0.3 to 0.4 nanograms per ml. Anything more than this indicates growth hormone excess. For example, if it's a traditional assay, then after giving 75 gram glucose post towards if you measure growth hormone and if it's more than one nanogram per ml, it is growth hormone excess and the diagnosis of acromegaly is confirmed. So I'll go for option B in this question. 21st question, a 45 year old woman came with complaints of fever, night sweats, generalized itching and unintentional weight loss of 10% in the last three months. On examination, she has enlarged axillary and cervical nodes. Lip node examination biopsy is shown in the following picture. And what we have the biopsy, classic reed stedberg cells, which indicates a probability of classic Hodgkin disease. And I cannot diagnose anything else in this picture. It's only Hodgkin lymphoma. And I'm going to Start with ABVD regime, which is standard initial regime for anyone with Hodgkin disease, especially classic Hodgkin disease. What's ABVD? It's adriamycin, bleomycin, vinblastin, dacarbazine based regime. Plus or minus in selected case, I can also use involved site radiotherapy that's called as ISRT. And if the patient is having refractory or relapse disease, I can even consider adding brentuximab to the regime, which is an anti-CD30 molecule, otherwise called as brentuximab vedotin. 
and uh, in very severe cases sometimes if you think it's a high risk you can even incorporate bacopregim which is beyond the scope of the current discussion 22nd question a 30 year old man present with episode of jaundice due to hepatitis b virus one year back on follow-up now he has normal levels of liver enzymes his current profile is shown in the image what is the diagnosis of this uh, current condition so of course one year back if he's having hepatitis b and now also if he's having hepatitis b it confirms the diagnosis of chronic hpv because by definition what do you mean by chronic hpv persistence of surface antigen for more than six months and clearly here the surface antigen is persisting you can see the orange line and of course this patient is having hepatitis b antigen positivity so because this patient is having chronic hbv and eag positive i'll go for option b easy one going to the 23rd question which of the following is true regarding the diagnosis of paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria or pnh flow cytometry is the gold standard for diagnosis this is correct definitely so we use flow because using flow cytometry we can diagnose pnh we can diagnose aplastic anemia and we can diagnose even certain forms like pnh aplastic anemia or lab syndromes that's why it is the gold standard where you see reduced expression of the gpa anchored proteins like cd55 and 59 option b states it's an inherited disorder with chronic intravascular hemolysis and frequent exacerbations here the second part of the statement is right but the first part of the statement is obviously wrong it's an acquired disorder thousands of times i've said it is an acquired disorder it's not inherited most common cause of death is heart failure anemia is wrong because most common cause of death is thromboembolism followed by infection. Sucrose lysis test is used for confirming the diagnosis is absolutely wrong because uh, it's not even currently used as a screening test in suspected cases. Right answer is option A. Up to 24th question, a 24-year-old male present with fever and myalgia on examination, he had a diffuse macropapular rash. Labs revealed a hemoglobin of 14, hematocrit of 55, high hematocrit. WPC count is 4000, lower normal range count of 25,000. So with this picture, I'll make a diagnosis of dengue any day. And what is the best prognostic indicator? Even though I use both platelets and hematocrit for monitoring patients with dengue, I would say the single most important and relevant test in the setting of uh, dengue is going to be the hematocrit. And this is the one that's going to guide you towards therapy as well. The hematocrit is high, then you're going to give more and more fluids. If the hematocrit is low and if the patient is in shock, you're going to transfuse blood products. As simple as that. Let us move on to 25th question. A 65 year old female presenting with a hip fracture. She has a past history of multiple fractures and DEXA revealed a T-score of minus 2.7, which means she is having osteoporosis. There is no doubt. And which of the following would be increased in her blood profile? So they are asking about markers of bone loss or osteoclastic activity. There are plenty of markers of bone loss. And uh, maybe you can say marker of osteoclastic activity but here surprisingly they have asked something that we don't use in practice that is tartrate resistant acid phosphatase you know osteocalcin bone specific alkaline phosphatase these are all going to be markers of bone formation or osteoblast but urinary hydroxyproline n terminal telopeptide c terminal telopeptide okay so these are all going to be markers of what your bone destruction or osteoclastic activity in that tartrate resistant acid phosphatase is also kind of a marker of osteoclastic activity bone loss so right answer is option d 26 question a 38 year old woman came with complaints of weakness and lethargy for the past uh, so many days and she's also having a past history of heavy menstrual bleeding her peripheral smear shows microcytic rbc's lab reports show hemoglobin of 7.9 she's anemic MCV is 65, very, very low. Anything less than 80 is going to be microcytic RBCs. And MCH is also low. TABC is increased. Transfer saturation is low. So low MCV, low TSAT, almost literally confirms that we are actually dealing with a case of iron deficiency anemia. If it's a hemolytic anemia, you're going to have a normocytic, normochromic RBCs with high reticulocyte count. If it's a hypoplastic anemia, we are I think we are basically talking about aplastic anemia. You might have a normochromic, normocytic picture or maybe a slightly macrocytic picture. And megaloblastic anemia, of course, will have macrocytic RBCs and not uh, microcytic RBCs. Easy one. Coming to 27th question, a patient with HIV who is currently on antiretroviral therapy consisting of azirudin, lamivudin, and nevirapine is diagnosed with tuberculosis. Considering potential drug interaction, which of the following drugs should be changed in this patient? So here the examiner is expecting you to answer rifampicin because it's not compatible to be used with nevirapine. Because rifampicin being such a powerful enzyme inducer, it can reduce the nevirapine levels to undetectable range. So it can risk ART failure. So I don't want that to happen in my patient. So I'm going to 
use maybe rifabutin or I'm not going to use rifampicin. That's what examiner expects. But in practice, it's the other way around. We are going to continue with rifampicin because it's a very commonly used drug, easily available drug. But we changed every bit. And we're going to use a compatible drug. Like for example, you can shift to maybe dolutegravir, double dose, 50 milligram two times a day. If you do not have dolutegravir or if the patient has already failed dolutegravir, then maybe lopinar, ritonavir, a double dose. 800 bar 200 is just fine, but dolutegravir based regimes are better. In this question, answer will be B though. 28th question, a 53-year-old woman presenting with complaints of fatigue, jaundice, edema and epidosplenomegaly. She has anemia, neutropenia, creatinine is 3.2, bone marrow examination shows 22% plasma cells. Are. Immunoglobin levels are more than 3 grams per decibel, which means she's having M spike as well, bone marrow, let it show whatever. I'm having more than 10% malignant plasma cells in the bone marrow with a couple of myeloma defining events, which are crap features like renal failure, anemia. I'm going to make a diagnosis of multiple myeloma. In multiple myeloma, why you should have edema? It could be because of renal failure or it could be because of restrictive cardiomyopathy, which is very common in amyloidosis. And why they should have epidosplenomegaly again? It is because of amyloid infiltration of the liver and spleen. So this is a clear cut case of multiple myeloma related amyloidosis. It's AL type of amyloidosis. It cannot be MGUS because in MGUS you never have myeloma defining event. Right, it's an asymptomatic condition. And what bone marrow is showing? Bone marrow is showing some densely packed tumor cells, whatever it may be, it shows some eosinophilic material in between, but really that doesn't matter. My diagnosis is multiple myeloma and AL amyloidosis in this case. 29th question, a person was taking antihypertensive drug prescribed for his hypertension. He was regular in his conception. Despite he is having some constipation, dry mouth and dizziness, this itself tells that the drug is clonidine. Recently, he went to a trip away from the country and he failed to carry medications with him and was not taking them since then. Currently, he has presented the OPD with the hypertensive emergency. What is the likely antihypertensive drug? So based on the side effect profile, based on the fact that withdrawal has resulted in severe hypertension, so the answer must be clonidine, which is an alpha agonist. So typically, specifically the alpha 2 agonism is important in terms of hypertension, but sometimes it can have a bit of alpha 1 agonism. Uh, that is what is the reason for the sedative effect of clonidine. Okay. 30th question, which of the following drugs when given with erythromycin can cause QT prolongation and toss at a point? So all of them are antihistaminics and we know the two antihistaminics that are going to cause a high risk of toss at a point is going to be astimazole and second is going to be terfenin. Terfenin has already been withdrawn from the market. Another one is astimazole, still available, but still it has a very high risk of toss at a point. All other drugs are antihistaminics only, but they don't have high risk of toss at just like these two drugs I have discussed, that is astimazole and terfenadine. 31st question, a 45 year old male with history of chronic alcohol use admitted to hospital. He present with anxiety, tremors and agitation after his last drink 24 hours ago, which means he's in a withdrawal state and it's a mild withdrawal, not like severe, with not a complicated withdrawal though. Which of the following medications is most appropriate for the control of withdrawal symptoms? Any withdrawal symptom, first line, gold standard, benzodiazepines. Especially if the patient is having any liver problem like cirrhosis or decomposed liver disease, then we are going to use short acting drugs like oxazepam or lorazepam. In this case, it's going to be lorazepam. That's it. That's benzodiazepine, first line drug. Fomipizole can be used in methanol or probably ethylene glycol toxicity because it's an alcohol dehydrogenase blocker. Disulfiram is used in chronic alcohol dependent states, which is an aldehyde dehydrogenase inhibitor, not an acute withdrawal. And buspirone is more of an anxiolytic drug. Here it doesn't really matter anything. So coming to the 32nd question, what's the rationale for the use of atropine in combination with diphenoxalate? So diphenoxalate is an OPI drug. It does have potential for abuse. If you use atropine together, which is an anticholinergic drug, in case the patient wants to take too much of diphenoxalate for the purpose of pleasure, uh, it comes along with too much of atropine so that it will cause a lot of side effects like dizziness, dry mouth, blurring of vision and so on. So that's the reason why we use this as a combination. One of the common combinations that's available in market is Lomotil. Again, I'm not here to promote any brands, but that's what is available in market. So it is actually... Uh, used together to prevent the abuse of diphenoxyl, which is an OPI drug. So that's the right answer. 33rd question, a 35 year old lady noticed a mass in the front of her neck. Otherwise, she has no symptoms on examination. She has a solitary thyroid nodule. Which of the following is the appropriate initial investigation in this patient? So if you suspect a functional thyroid disorder or a structural thyroid disorder, really doesn't matter. You can notice that there is a solitary thyroid nodule in this lady. The first test is almost always going to be thyroid function testing. We are going to use a free T4, a total T3 and a TSH. Among the three, if you ask me, the most important test is going to be the TSH. That's it. 
Thirty fourth question: A fifty year old male presenting with tearing pain of the chest that intensely radiated to the back, which means we are dealing with aortic dissection. He had non-specific easy changes and drop eye was negative, which means they are telling it's not really an infarction. Uh, during the course of his evaluation, he passed away. Unfortunately, biopsy of the aorta obtained during autopsy is shown. What's the likely mechanism behind this disease? So what should have caused IT dissection? It's a split intima here. That's what they have shown. So what is the reason for that? So it is connective tissue weakness. Fibrinoid necrosis can occur in certain va vasculitis and probably in patients with malignant hypertension, but that's not the case here. Subintimal lipid infiltration with smooth muscle necrosis more favors atherosclerosis that's not the mechanism here immune complex vasculitis again is not the uh, real mechanism of aortic dissection so the right answer for this is d connective tissue weakness coming to the 35th question a 45 year old male with a history of depression was initially being treated with amitriptyllin but his symptoms were not adequately controlled his medication regime was changed to include a mau inhibitor and cetrolin so this is a dangerous combination because we know this can lead to serotonin syndrome. Shortly after this, he developed agitation and seizures. On examination, he had marked hyperreflexia and tremors. And sometimes patient can even have clonus and ocular clonus is so characteristic of serotonin syndrome. What is the most appropriate treatment? Here, everything fits into diagnosis of serotonin syndrome and answer is cyproheptadin. So that's basically the drug that we use for serotonin syndrome, at least theoretically, but practically it's efficacy is always questioned trials say that it's not that efficacious as we think coming to 36th question a child present with anemia neutropenia and depigmentation of hair and nails which of the following deficiencies is most likely to be associated with this presentation so it's going to be copper copper deficiency is something that's going to have variety of manifestation they can present with any form of anemia sometimes microcytic anemia sometimes normocytic sometimes even megaloblastic picture Neutropenia is also quite common with copper deficiency and uh, deep pigmentation of hair and nails and that frizzy hair is quite common and that's the reason for that characteristic Menkes Kinkes hair syndrome which is due to ATP 7A defect where the patient is going to have copper deficiency. Zinc deficiency is a kind of a closed DD but it's going to present more with dermatologic and mucoglutinous manifestations and most children with zinc deficiency tend to have uh, growth retardation and probably poor sexual maturation, especially hypogonadism in male children. So that's not the case. So it's not zinc deficiency. Fluoride deficiency can lead to non-specific problems like uh, poor healing after fall of the tooth. Iron deficiency, you know, it's going to present in a very, very different way. So right answer is option A, copper deficiency. 37th question, a 25-year-old patient present with history of recurrent sinusitis, bronchiectasis and chronic cough. He also mentioned that he had, had several ear infections and episodes of pneumonia over the past few years. On physical examination, he noted digital clubbing, chest x-ray is obtained and is shown. What is the most likely diagnosis? What do you see in the chest x-ray? You can see dextrocardia. So this probably suggests that the patient is having situs inverses. Situs inverse and you can also see the fundic gas bubble on the right side so that clearly tells that we are dealing with situs inverses and in a case of sinusitis, bronchiectasis, okay, and recurrent infections, we think about primary ciliary dyskinesia along with situs inverses this becomes Carter-Jenner syndrome. Other things will not fit into the picture. 38th question, 54 year old man with history of hypertension Presence with shortness of breath and palpitations on examination, he has an irregularly irregular pulse, which means we are dealing with atrial fibrillation and patient is also having bilateral basal crackles, which is a sign of heart failure. EZ shows ventricular response of 110 beats per minute, which of the following statements is correct. You can notice the ECG showing a simple atrial fibrillation, that's it, which means the patient is having an irregular rhythm with no discernible P waves in between, that is atrial fibrillation. All good. So now we need to find out which is not correct. IV digoxin can be used for ventricular rate control. Absolutely fine, yes. In fact, if the patient is having acute heart failure, like what you're seeing in this case, you can use digoxin even in IV form, no problem. DOACs, yes, in patients who do not have moderate to severe MS and in patients who do not have a mechanical prosthetic valve, DOACs are the choice for anticoagulation. If you're admitting, then you can give heparin, but the choice is going to, oral choice is going to be DOACs. Cardiovision should be done if the patient is hemodynamically unstable. That's perfectly fine. That's why we use a protocol called as RACE protocol. What is RACE protocol? Rate control, anticoagulation, cardioversion and electricity if the patient is unstable, right? 
and last but not the least option d beta blockers are given if the patient has decomposite heart failure and intolerant to calcium channel blockers this is wrong in multiple ways first of all the first line is never ccbc is going to be beta blockers only that too if the patient is having decomposite heart failure or any acute heart failure sign i'm not going to give a negative inotropic drug like ccb or beta blocker so this is absolutely absolutely wrong so right answer for this question is going to be option d third time question a 28 year old woman presents with complaints of weakness and generalized fatigue peripheral smear shows microcytic hypochromic rbc serum ion is decreased and patient is having increased rdw mcv and mch are low tabc was high so what would be her transfer in saturation so we know we are dealing with the case of iron deficiency anemia here they have just told the answer straight away so they are asking just what is the transplant saturation the transplant saturation is going to be low in a patient with iron deficiency anemia because transplant saturation is nothing but iron by tabc in patients with iron deficiency anemia iron is going to be low tabc is going to be high and transplant saturation is going to be typically less than 18 percentage in practice we take a cutoff of 20 percentage though so it will be reduced no doubt for this question, a young athlete was diagnosed to have hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and a harsh ejection systolic murmur was heard. Which of the following murmurs will likely to increase the murmur? So we know the murmur and obstruction in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is directly proportional to contractility and inversely proportional to load. Which means if you increase preloader afterload, the murmur is going to come down. If you reduce the preloader afterload, it's going to increase the murmur. So what is going to reduce the preloader afterload? Among the given options, it's going to be Valsalva. Very, very powerful maneuver that's going to increase LVOT obstruction and increase the murmur. Isometric hand, hand grip is going to reduce the murmur by increasing the afterload. Squatting is going to increase the preload and because of that, your LVOT obstruction will reduce and murmur will reduce. Leaning forward is unrelated in this patient. So leaning forward can accentuate the murmur in patients with aortic stenosis because the aortic valve comes closer to the chest wall, but has no effect on patients with HOCM. Coming to 41st question, which of the following is suggestive of pseudomembranous colitis? Answer is A, because you can see a yellowish pseudomembrane here with a lot of ulcers. And B is suggestive of felony esophagus, which is seen in eosinophilic esophagitis. And C is suggestive of diverticulosis. You can see small, small diverticular pouches. And D is suggestive of cancer malignancy. You can see a mass over there. 42nd question, a 50-year-old patient who was being treated for hypertriglycidemia developed flushing, gout, hyperglycemia, and raised liver enzymes. Which drug is the most likely cause? Simple. The one drug that produces all of this is going to be nicotinamide, that is niacin. So niacin is something that can produce hyperuricemia and gout. It can produce hyperglycemia and worsening of diabetes or new onset diabetes. It can also cause liver injury and it can elevate liver enzymes and it can cause prostaglandin-mediated flushing as well. Right answer is nicotinamide. 43rd question, which of the following growth hormone analogs is uh, not used for the treatment of growth hormone deficiency, but it is used in the treatment of HIV associated lipodystrophy. The only drug approved for this indication is going to be t -samorlin. Other drugs are not approved for this purpose. In fact, pegvisomant is something that's going to block the growth hormone receptor. So that's used usually in patients with acromegaly as an add-on therapy. Somatropin is nothing but recombinant growth hormone that's not approved for this purpose. 44th question, a 30-year-old female in late pregnancy presents with seizure and high blood pressure. She is diagnosed with eclampsia and started on magnesium sulfate. As a part of her management, certain parameters require close monitoring to prevent magnesium toxicity. Which of the following parameters does not require routine checking during magnesium sulfate therapy in this patient? So one thing that is not routinely required is serum magnesium levels. There are special indications for doing serum magnesium levels. Number one, if you are suspecting toxicity, for example, if the patient is having loss of deep tendon reflexes, or the patient is having respiratory depression. So in these cases, you can do. Number two, if the patient is already having some renal failure, for example, like serum creatinine is more than 1.1. So in this case also, you can do serum magnesium testing. So apart from that, we don't really do serum magnesium levels. There are some special indications for that. Usually we go by the clinical examination. That is deep DTR testing, especially knee jerk, urine output and respiratory rate assessment. Serum magnesium levels are not routinely required in a patient who's receiving magnesium sulfate. We already discussed about that in detail as well. 45th question. A 30 year old drug addict presents to the emergency department signs of unknown drug poisoning. Patient exhibits dilated pupils, that's metriasis. Sweating is there, tachycardia is there, tremors are there. On examining blood pressure is 160 upon 100. Hypertensive and heart rate is also high. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Easy one. So young guy, like 
attending some rave parties, of course, it's going to be cocaine intoxication. So that fits into the diagnosis. Morphine is going to produce pinpoint pupils and patient will be generally like uh, having like low temperature, bradypnea and all. So that's not the case. Cannabis poisoning can produce mild euphoria, but again, the picture doesn't fit into cannabis poisoning. Alcohol intoxication typically is going to present uh, in a very very different way so this patient is having what the features that are going to be absolutely in favor of cocaine intoxication in fact if you are arguing against alcohol intoxication i would say the patient will have lower bp usually in fact and they usually tend to present with hypoglycemia also that's not the case here so definitely it must be cocaine intoxication perfectly fits into the picture 46th question which of the following drugs used in the treatment of irritable bowel syndrome has a direct spasmolytic action on the GA smooth muscle so one drug that we very commonly use in modern practice is mebaverin. So that has a direct spasmolytic action on the GI smooth muscle. Dicyclomin is an anticholinergic drug. It acts via different mechanism. It's not direct, it's indirect via anticholinergic mechanism. Scopolamine, same. Rasika total is an encephalinous inhibitor. We use in acute diarrhea because it reduces secretions. The answer for this question is mebaverin, which has a direct action. 47th question. A patient has blunt injury to the abdomen after an road traffic accident and underwent ileal resection. He requires well post-surgery, but months later he presents fatigue and excess intolerance, which of the following will not be seen. So when you cut the ileum, so what is the most important deficiency you're going to get? You're going to get something called B-dole deficiency. So with B-dole deficiency, you can have cytonuclear dyssynchrony, which means uh, that's the reason for that megaloblastosis. We know that. And Romberg sign may be positive because patients may develop Posterior dysfunction because of the subacute combined degeneration of the cord. And what you don't see is easy microcytic hypogromic anemia because uh, B12 deficiency is going to produce megaloblastic anemia and macrocytosis. I think this is the last question in the second shift. 40 year old man had a RTA and was admitted in the hospital. After a few days, he had an exaggerated right sided extensor plantar reflex and uh, knee jerk. What other finding would be seen? So I think probably they are talking about bronze acquired syndrome here. If I'm not wrong, I don't know the exact wordings in the question, but I think they are talking about bronze acquired syndrome. So in bronze acquired syndrome, you're going to have uh, problems with regards to posterior column on the right, on the same side, ipsilateral, and you have corticospinal tract dysfunction on the same side, ipsilateral, and the only thing that's going to be contralateral is going to be the loss of pain and temperature, the spinal thermic tract. So atrophy is never a feature of human. So you're going to see corticospinal tract dysfunction, so it's going to be no atrophy here. So loss of proprioception on the left leg is wrong because posterior column dysfunction will be seen on the same side, same right side. Ankle clonus on the right foot, this is correct because this is a human type lesion. Fasciculations on the right foot is also wrong because it indicates element. So right answer for this question is ankle clonus on the right foot. If the wordings are correct and if this is a case of brown sequard syndrome. Okay, so that completes our discussion of the NEAT PG 2024 paper and uh, the questions were a little bit on the tougher side and especially with lengthy questions, it makes the situation even more tougher for the students. But nevertheless, uh, that doesn't mean that we should not know concepts. We have to know concepts ultimately and that's what is going to help in the exams, even in the future exams, even if uh, questions come in any different pattern or any different type, it really doesn't matter. Just make sure concepts are good and are going to do well. Thank you very, very much.